Wow. I, I have to say, I'm actually nervous here for a very few reasons, and that doesn't matter. When I was young, you know, in high school, I'm going to talk about reality. I'm going to talk about my real time here at Berkeley as a student a couple of times, and not about founding Apple and all that, that stuff leading up to it, but you're going to see a lot of clues in there, and you're going to get an idea of how I think. Um, I was academically lucky in school, and for some reason, I decided I was going to be an engineer because engineers are going to give us products that make life easier. Someday, engineers were going to bring products to the world that were going to let us work four days instead of five days. Um, <laughs> we missed, but that was, my, that was my motivation. I was also very strongly motivated towards education, and of course, the culmination of your education is often the university, and education, university is education, which leads to success. And success is sort of should make you happy. I, I like to cut things out. When I'm designing a circuit and there's 10 little parts in between the middlemen, get rid of them, figure out a way to get things done simply with the fewest parts. And I said, go straight to the happiness. So I came up with the formula, H equals S minus F. Happiness equals smiles minus frowns. That easy. <laughs> If you feel good, you smile. If I were to die and I felt good and every day of my life I joked with people out on the street and I didn't have a home, I'd be better off than the guy who ran everything and was grilling and, you know, sort of unhappy inside. But how do you get, but happiness equals smiles minus frowns. How do you get rid of the frowns? Well, you don't care so much about things that they're going to give you frowns. You don't have to win arguments, you know. Everybody, everybody's good. Both sides are good. You don't have to win. The only person you have to win an argument with is against yourself. So don't really get upset when your car gets scratched, these sort of things. And that, that formula took me a long way through life. By the time I came back to Berkeley my second time, I did modify the formula a little to H equals F cubed. Happiness equals three Fs. Food, fun, and friends. <laughs> Food... Food is a metaphor for the, for the necessities of life, you know, shelter and clothes and stuff. And, um, and um, fun and friends is obvious. Well, when I told this, I was being inducted into my high school hall of fame, and seven of the first ten people instrumental in starting Apple Computer actually went to the same high school. You start with your friends, and of course the university friends all go back to different cities, so you're never together. But they were all, you know, that's how you do when you don't have any money. You start in a house, you start in your garage. Well, I told that when I was being inducted into my high school hall of fame, and I, the students started laughing, and I had to embarrassingly say into the microphone, uh, there might be a fourth F. <laughs> now, in those years, before I got to Berkeley, in my bedroom at home, hanging on my wall was, I don't know if you can see it, maybe it's not projected, but um, it's actually a... I had posters of computers, computers in racks. This computer could sit on a table. I told my dad, I'm going to have my own computer someday. He said, it costs as much as a house. And I said, I'm going to live in an apartment. And it <laughs> stuck with me. Now, in high school, I was kind of a, a prankster. I did a lot of them, but I don't, don't have time to tell all that, those stories. But I remember one that, that I favored. I got into the daily announcements to everybody that Stanford's head janitor was going to speak on higher custodial education. You know, and, and the students would laugh and the teachers would tell them, no, 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 that's serious. It's real. <laughs> so um, somehow during high school, as I said, I was academically lucky. Um, I somehow, there were no classes on computers. There were no computers. I taught myself from little materials I'd stumbled onto, taught myself on paper and pencil, only paper and pencil, how to design computers and took those thousands of hours. They say it takes 10,000 hours to get good at something. Every weekend I shut my door and just worked and I taught myself, in essence, writing the book. You can write the book. You don't have to believe. The only, the only intelligence I get in the world comes from books. It comes from classes. If I have the same answer as everyone else, I get a good grade and they call me intelligent. Well, that's not what it really is. Got to Berkeley. Berkeley was a symbol of free speech back in those days. It was a symbol of civil rights. And the movie The Graduate hit when I graduated from high school. Also, also, that year, 1968, was when uh, Leonard Nimoy wrote his comments about the girl that was biracial and, and worried, you know, about being bullied and all that. Um, you might see that. It's going around in the news today. Well, um, got here. Vietnam War was going on, and I had become a pacifist. I thought brain over brawn. Some people are strong, and they have force, they have power, they have wealth, and some people use their brain and figure things out and do things smartly, and I wanted to be on the brain side. And I also became a pacifist as far as wars go and things like that. But here I got to Berkeley, famous for, you know, tear gas and people's parks and all that. And I, <laughs> and I, there was a protest going on. My, like my first day here, there was a protest going on out in some field. And I went and I joined in with all these people and I was all alone. I wasn't with anyone, just watching what's going on. And all of a sudden some cops drove up. And they, they got out and they were in heavy, heavy armaments. They started marching towards us. And I was too scared to run. Everyone else ran away. 
I thought, you run from a cop, you're guilty, right? So I waited there and the cops came up to me and I said, what do I do? I don't know what to do. They said, run. <laughs> so I ran. They were, there were a lot of students in our dorm, Norton Hall, that were collecting like little rubber bullets you could find because the cops would come and start shooting rubber bullets down the street at people and, and give them big bruises from that. And they would find, tear gas would go off once in a while. Oh my gosh, I hung out where I thought there might be some tear gas canister launch and I always hoped that I could get right at the canister when it puffed out and my friend across the street would take a picture of me by it, smiling. <laughs> Never quite got that picture. I was in Norton Hall. It was an all men's dormitory back then. And the first night I arrived, Late at night, my roommate came in and he talked about, oh, a bunch of them been together in the lounge and they hung this guy named Harvey off of either the first floor lounge or the seventh floor lounge by his feet. I don't know why. I think they lowered him to the ground off the first floor lounge. I said, this is going to be a good year. We're going to have some fun. Yeah, I designed this little um, big slingshot made of four rubber bands, tied to four rubber bands, tied to four rubber bands. You could stretch it across a dorm room all the way out into the hallway and shoot an egg across um, Durant and it would hit the payphone. <laughs> or, or an M80 or a cherry bomb. And, uh, and we would do this. I don't know how we never got caught for these things. The only guy that got caught the whole year for a, for a firecracker was upstairs somewhere. Um, sometimes at that payphone, we had a lot of fun. We'd put shaving cream on the uh, earpiece and then we'd phone it from our dorm room watching across the street. And when somebody ran into the payphone and grabbed the, grabbed the payphone, We'd start, uh, you would hear them cussing, and then we'd tell them it was product marketing for some shaving cream. <laughs> I was, of course, I was the electronic guy, leading a little electronic crowd. We had all the, the phone lines of the entire dorm going right up our unlocked cabinet on the first floor. And it was easy to grab the um, RA was uh, Lee Steinberg. He's very famous because they made movies like The Color of Movie about the first, the, one of the major sports reps that reps sports figures and all that. And he was the RA and I would t like take his phone line, attach it to an unused phone in room 134. Nobody was there. Go in and use that phone and try testing, dialing numbers all over the world on his expense. <laughs> Went over to the payphone, did a trick I heard about, undid a yellow wire on the payphone. And then, you know, people came all day long, couldn't make phone calls, and at the end of the day, we'd attach the yellow wire, and ding, 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 all this money came out. <laughs> a magazine sold right here, right here in town, I bought it here, and um, a book came out that year that told how to make a deal, a thing called a black box. Two little $1 parts and a switch. You could buy it at Radio Shack, put it on your phone line in the dorm, and whoever calls you doesn't get billed. Okay, it was really funny because there was a pole vaulter up on the eighth floor and his parents wrote him a letter wondering why they hadn't been billed for two calls from Florida. So, and I was, by the way, I was a pole vaulter in high school too. Believe it or not, skinny and all. Um, <laughs> I had a car. I had taken one year off to work to earn the money to put myself through Berkeley, not burden my parents. I had also bought a car, a Pinto. And every weekend, I was the one who got to drive groups of us down to Harvey's house was in, in uh, uh, Taft, California. And, and we'd go to Rosemead at Bill Dubel's house and they treated us so well. And, and I'd go to see my parents and I'd go to Tijuana. Those dogs couldn't smell gunpowder. So I'd buy the big M80s and cherry bombs and drive back to the dorm, man. We, our carpet was just totally burnt the whole way. And the only guy that got caught, as I said, was upstairs. Well, one time we decided to make a popcorn bomb, a bag of popcorn with a cherry bomb in the middle, and we'd slide it down this 40-pound fishing line I had that Steve Jobs and I had done a prank with from the seventh floor lounge of Norton Hall over to the, above the garden in um, Ida Sproul Hall, above the first floor lounge, and we, the, it was the house mother's garden. And, we're, and we, we put all the physics to calculate how long the fuse should be on, on the blackboard in the, our seventh floor lounge. We're real proud of that one. Um, <laughs> In those days, for computer programs, the computer was in the basement of the new Evans Hall. And you go down the basement, there were all these key punches. You type on key punches, and it punches holes in cards for your letters. And at finals time, it took 40 minutes to get on a key punch. Everybody was lined up for 40 minutes. You'd have to wait. There were two key punches over there for an IBM computer, and it, you know, and it printed the wrong characters, and it, didn't, it, didn't just, it just wasn't right. It wasn't the right holes. I touch typed everything. I was a good typist. And in, in those computer punch days, you had to, to get special characters like parentheses, you had to hit two keys with the left hand. Little pinky plus another key, little pinky plus a different key. And I was good at touch typing everything. I found out that those IBM key punches, if you type touch without looking at the wrong characters being printed, the holes were right. And the computer only knew the holes. 
That was one of my claims to fame on the card punch. We had little boxes of all those little chits that came out of the card punches. And of course, one time they stuck an M80 in one and shoved it under my bed. Pow! I, it took forever to clean that thing up. Another, another time, I'd go to, the, I'd go to the, the, we had a food service, and I'd bring back salting crackers. I had stacked up 17 pounds worth of salting crackers in my dorm room on the shelf just inside the door. And I was down in the other, the unoccupied room playing phone tricks one time, and I heard an explosion. I knew what it was. Har <laughs> Harvey had set off an, an, an M80 in the middle of those, of the salting crackers all over the floor, bits of them. <laughs> My roommate, John, and I just scooped it up and scooped it into a full trash can. Then we thought, we got an idea, we'd go up to Harvey's floor, we'll get a friend of ours to put a tape over Harvey's door so when it closes, it doesn't lock. And then, and then uh, Harvey discovered the tape. So then we went down by Harvey's room and there was a fire escape. And the fire escape had a window that you could open, and right there was Harvey's window at right angles to it, and he had no wind, the window was open, no screen on it. So we took, we took, a, we took a, um, uh, a broom and shoveled bits of these, these crackers the entire thing onto his bed, right onto his bed. <laughs> and, and the RA came up with a vacuum cleaner to help him clean it up because he was kind of pissed, and they accidentally plugged in the vacuum cleaner in blowing mode. <laughs> um, I loved typing a lot. I loved typing. I, was, I, was, I beat the, the girls in high school at typing too, actually, which was unheard of in those days. And I, I would type people's papers. In those days, you know, you type, you can't make a single mistake or you have to go back and correct it with whiteout. This wasn't like today's computer, you know, word processing days. I would type a paper all night long till six in the morning and charge five cents. And when I came back to, when I came back my second time to Berkeley, I would charge five cents for um, tutoring, as we'll get to. We had the blue box, the night I met Captain Crunch, the most famous phone freak. I'd been spreading the lore all, all over the campus. And he came to visit me in the dorm and I opened it up. He taught us codes up in pizza, Kip's Pizza Parlor till late at night. Steve Jobs and I then had to drive home, car broke down. Went over to a, to a, uh, um, a gas station, there was a payphone. We said, we've got to try to do this blue box at a payphone. And we tried, and the operator came on the line, Steve was all scared, and, and then he tried again. The operator came on the line, he was all scared, and got me the blue box when the cops showed up. Cops said, what is this device? I said, the Moog synthesizer was brand new. The first music synthesizer ever where electronics created music. And I said, it's a music synthesizer. It makes tones when you press the buttons. And the cops finally put us in their car, and we knew where we were going, down to the police station. Cop turns around, hands me back the blue box. He says, guy named Moog beat you to it. Oh my God, that they were bamboozled. Um, yeah, I took all, I had four classes, all graduate classes in hardware design and software design, all in the same room in Quarry Hall. I sat in the same seat. No class started before noon either. And I sat in the same seat for two classes on Monday and Wednesday, same seat for two classes on Tuesday and Thursday. You couldn't make up something like that. At the end of the year, my roommate wrote a, a report for, for English that he was supposed to, for a literature, for a writing class. And it was all about a guy named Alfonso, labeled fiction. Every bit of it was totally true about what we had done in our dorm that year. <laughs> but nobody would believe it. Um, I had this, got this incredible job eventually working at Hewlett Packard on the iPhone 6 of its time, the HP 35 scientific calculator that was going to change everything. And Hewlett Packard values, they valued you as an employee of the company and an owner of the company. And I did a lot of projects on the side for love. People heard that. Uh, they could come to this young engineer at Hewlett Packard, and I didn't have a degree yet. I had three years done at Berkeley, but they tested, they interviewed me, and I was I could do the engineering job. So people would come to me, and I would design products for them for free. And once a year, Steve Jobs would come into town and say, "That's a neat thing you built just for fun. We got to sell this. We can sell it." And he turned them all into money. Um, Homebrew Computer Club had a lot of college professors and academics talking about the social revolution that was going to come when we had our own computer, and that eventually led to me building a computer giving it away for free. I was a hero at the club. I actually took Steve Jobs, don't believe the movie, where it shows him taking me to a club. And he... <laughs> huh. Steve, Steve didn't know the computer existed, and he came into town, he saw the, the crowd around me, and he said, we gotta sell a part of this. We can build it for 20 bucks and sell it for 40. And that was the start of Apple, and uh, when it came time to give stock, I thought, you know what, there were a bunch of little other people around us that were like founders. They were in those founding days. They were young people, in high school, some of them. And you know what, how come a few of us at the top got this incredible riches when we went public with our stock and they didn't seem to get anything. They didn't get stock or anything and you might've seen that in the movie. And so I actually took 20 million of today's dollars of my own stock and I gave it to five of those young people that have been with us. Because why would I have done anything if I didn't have friends around talking about this is a good thing to do? And then to 80 other employees, I sold.
I sold pre-IPO stock because, you know, you know what, I just felt that it was just, you know, we, we need a better, um, we, um, I don't know, equalization of income in this country. Um, more like Canada. When I returned for my last year of college, 10 years in Apple, my name was famous, so I had to use a fake name, and my diploma, my Berkeley diploma, I got them to, to put it in that name, Rocky Raccoon Clark. <laughs> and I would walk home, I lived on the north side that year, and I'd walk home, and every day at LaValle's Pizza Parlor north side, I'd play Defender. Oh, it's an action game. And it took me many years before I could roll the score over, but eventually I did. That's, that's all I have. Go Bears, go Oski, go Sharks. Um, for mathematicians, go forth and multiply. <laughs> Live long and find happiness or prosper. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.